Shalom, Chavarim. I'm Steve Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And listen, you may have listened to this video last night on the Noon Institute. We published this originally, um, but we decided to come back and edit part of this video. And the reason being is one of the comments that showed up below uh, stated that Mark may have actually taken his ideology not so much from the Talmud, but actually from the book of Jasher. Uh, now, in part, maybe that is true, but if you listen to what Mark says when he talks about it, it was believed that there was a school set up and it was a school that uh, maybe Jacob attended, etc. That's more Talmudic. And so I'm going to still continue into that issue there of the Talmud because I know that Mark is also using that, like in the case of the, uh, the seven Noahide laws, uh, he defends the Talmud. And so that's a big issue. But I want to address specifically as well, so we've edited this section into the video that you're going to see here as the video continues on. Uh, after You'll see the part played as we did before uh, where Mark speaks about these issues. And then I will address the issues of the book of Jasher as well. All right. So please, if you listened to it last night, you might want to listen again. A lot of the same ending will be the same, though, and I'm sure you'll appreciate those things, especially from the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls that are uh, inside the video as well. Thank you for listening. And, uh, you know, look, I have no problem when, uh, I don't agree with it, but when Orthodox Jews, if they use the Talmud for their purpose, for their teaching of their congregations, that's freedom of religion, something we have here in America. Uh, not necessarily on college campuses any longer after President Trump's executive order that pretty much robbed all college students across uh, America, their rights of freedom of speech. But, uh, but otherwise, there is still freedom of religion for a short period of time, I'm sure. That will probably be taken away very soon. But in, in places such as Mark Vilsa's congregation here, uh, the, the teaching of the Talmud is becoming main you know pretty much every day and maybe his congregation is aware of it maybe they're not i'm not really sure what they're aware of or what they're not aware of uh, but he also is leaning uh, or, or using the anti-semitism card like many jews do in order to try to silence any dissent that comes against them because he clearly is teaching uh talmudic teachings inside of his own congregation and of course it's his congregation. He has a right to teach them what he so chooses. But then what happens is those, those messages are loaded up onto the internet. And of course, everybody and anybody can watch them for themselves and see too. And this one, of course, got brought to my attention because of the fact of Melchizedek. Uh, Mark in here, he makes a, a major case here for Melchizedek being that he is actually was sham. He wasn't the Melchizedek that is spoken of by Paul in the book of Hebrews. Uh, no, instead he's another kind of Melchizedek, and he tries to justify it using the Talmud. I don't know sometimes, though, if uh, maybe Mark's congregation is fully aware that the Talmud is where he gets the information from, but I know many of our viewers that listen here have no clue that this is where Mark is getting this from. Well, I happen to know because... You know, that's my background as well. Uh, not that I was raised in Judaism because our family were non-practicing Jews, but nonetheless, I have made it a purpose to study very deeply into this and have all the necessary resources at my own fingertips. And we're not talking about Google search either, but our own collection of Talmud, Talmud Aruch Shulchan, the Babylonian Talmud, uh, the Mishnah, the Midrash. We have all the collections, both Hebrew and English, so that we can study these things for ourselves to be able to help our listeners to know what's really written and what's going on. Uh, and yet, uh, what I want to do is I want to start off, though, before, before I get too deep into this issue on Melchizedek with you, and that is because after Mark really gets into this teaching that Melchizedek is actually Shem, by the way, Shem, for those who are not familiar with this, this is Noah's youngest son, that he was actually Melchizedek. And again, like I said, he's going to base this on Talmudic teachings. But after he goes through that, Mark then gets into uh, an, an analogy of when the wells of, uh, uh, of Abraham and Isaac, they were being stopped up. And of course, Jacob, they're trying to 
uncover these wells. And he uses that analogy as an analogy of today's believers trying to go back and drink from the wells of water that were dug originally by Abraham. Uh, but in this case here, he's using oral law. Uh, not the actual biblical word, but oral Torah, as they call it, which is the Talmud, and says that uh, Christians are just trying to stop up those wells, which he calls anti-Semitic. Again, it's like a race card being played, but it's in Judaism. And quite frankly, after Trump signed the executive order, that's exactly what he's done. He's made a religion a race of people. I wonder if I can play that card as well then, because after all, uh, my ancestors are, well, forget it. I will stick with Jesus Christ. It's a whole lot better, if you ask me. But anyway, and look, I have to tell you something. This, again, is nothing against Mark. I, I would, for anything, love to see Mark wake up to what's going on and come out of this nonsense. So, and we know that there are some of the, uh, the friends here that listen to Israeli News Live that, are, that actually attend Mark's church itself or his congregation. Uh, I don't think Mark considers his, uh, his congregation a church, uh, but uh, this is where they, they gather together to worship. And, but I think that we need to deal with this issue because, like I said, this is affecting many, many believers all over the world as Mark also makes these things public to the rest of the world. Let me play this first little clip for you because, like I said, it is the anti-Semitism card. And like this article here says here, uh, back in, of course, uh, 2018 of November last year, the return of Christians' anti-Semitism, and they put the picture of the anti-Semitism definition in there, and they also call it a hostility to and a prejudice towards Jewish people. No, uh, it's, not a, it's not a hostility towards the Jewish people. It's pointing out a truth and trying to get people to wake up to what these truths are. All right, let's take a look at this right here, what Mark has to say. Talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face. And uh, this is all done out of spite, so Isaac just undigs all the wells that were stopped. Okay, it says because the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. I just can't imagine why someone would block a well of water. And look at this. What does Isaac do? He calls their names after the same names by which his father had called them. All right, now let me give you a little concept, another way of looking at this Bible verse. As we here today reinvestigate and are digging back into the ancient roots of our biblical faith, it's much like Isaac's journey going back to the wells of his father. The original sources have been hidden and buried from Gentiles. And we know the Torah is also likened to a well of living water springing up. And it has been hidden from us and filled with dirt. And so God is telling us, you know, the non-Jews, the wells of water have been filled with dirt. Why? Because of anti-Semitism. Largely. By the church over the last 2,000 years. So what we're doing today prophetically is what Isaac was doing is reinvestigating and uh, reopening these wells of living water. All right. Now, anybody that knows, Jesus Christ is the living water. He is that well that needs to be unstopped and not stopped up. Now, I would not be against it all when Mark says about this as far as the Torah. I'm not against that in the least bit, if it was just about going back and digging out through the Old Testament and the prophets and, of course, the, the, uh, the books of Moses, you know, nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, this is what all Christians normally do. They go back and study these things. You know, in fact, most Christians that I know, they love to look at these uh, amazing passages. But it's just kind of awkward that Mark brings this up at the time when he has not spent so much time on the Torah, the law of Moses or, or the prophets, but rather, instead, it's right after he's given us all of these Talmudic teachings. Listen to what I'm talking about here. And of course, this is where we're going to get into Melchizedek. I think this is the important part to correct 
a major error that is being taught uh, by Mark on this issue of Melchizedek. Yes, in Genesis 14, 18, and 19, going back a few Torah portions, here we have Melchizedek. He's the king of Salem. This is where we get Jerusalem from. He's the king of Salem. They say that Melchizedek had a Bible school in Jerusalem, and uh, that's where Isaac went and studied, and uh, Jacob went and studied. Uh, and it says he was not only king, he was also what? The priest of the Most High God. So here we have the king and the priesthood united. Okay, this is long before Moses, about 500 years. And he blessed them and he said, Blessed be Abr Abram, the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, the kingly priesthood of Melchizedek is being passed on. It is taught that Melchizedek was Shem. In case you didn't know that, Melchizedek is a title. King of righteousness. Uh, but it is believed that he was Shem. Well, guess what? In Exodus 19.6, God tells Israel that he wanted them to be a kingdom of priests. A holy nation. And these are the words he says you're to speak to the children of Israel. So, after Shem died, who is alive at the time to inherit the priesthood? Who's supposed to get this, the kingship? The priesthood. Esau's perspective was that he was going to die anyway, therefore the birthright was meaningless to him. So let, let's kind of look at how they are described. But what I believe is Shem has died and, and now they're serving the bread and the lentils and we're about to see who's going to get the birthright. That's why this was so significant, this whole story. But if we look at Genesis 25 and verse 27... Uh, it says, the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter. He was a man. All right, so the point is here, as Mark brings out here, is that uh, Shem is supposed to be Melchizedek. And he says there that it's actually taught that he was Melchizedek. In fact, if we back up just a little bit here, I think into 1930, let me play this here. See if we get it right here. Right, and I want you to notice here, this is the Jewish meaning. That is meaning years old when Shem dies. And Isaac knew Shem for quite a while. Uh, the question is, did Isaac go to Jerusalem and visit uh, his very great grandpa Shem uh, right after uh, Abraham supposedly offered him up, remember, and all of a sudden he disappears? Maybe he went to go see Shem for a while. Well, look at this in Genesis 14, 18, and 19, going back a few Torah portions. Here we have Melchizedek. He's the king of Salem. This is where we get Jerusalem from. He's the king of Salem. They say that Melchizedek had a Bible school in Jerusalem, and uh, that's where Isaac went and studied, and uh, Jacob went and studied. Uh, and it says he was not only king, he was also what? The priest of the Most High God. So here we have the king and the priesthood united. Okay, this is long before Moses, about 500 years. And he blessed them and he said, Blessed be Abr Abram, the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, the kingly priesthood of Melchizedek is being passed on. It is taught that Melchizedek was Shem. In case you didn't know that, Melchizedek is a title. King of... All right, now... If we go to Genesis 28, for example. All right, so in all fairness, uh, I, 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 we had to edit this part into the video as well because uh, some people had actually commented to me that Mark may not just be taking uh, his ideology about Shem being Melchizedek from the Talmud, but rather from the book of Jasher. So therefore, it is like an authentication if he's doing such. Now, granted, again, Mark, I was the exact same place you are. I have always looked at the book of Jasher as authentic because of the fact of, well, it's cited from the Bible. We see it in the book of, uh, cited, uh, what is it? I think it's in the book of Joshua or the book of Genesis. There's several places throughout our scriptures that cites the ancient book of the book of Jasher. However, we don't have any ancient uh, document that's old enough that we could actually say this is the book of Jasher. And 
Again, like I said, I've also done the same. But what's going to really surprise you, especially those of you that actually had uh, sent this to me that he's quoting this, is where does the book of Jesha really come from? That's something that you're going to find very interesting. All right, there's all types of different uh, sources out there, and it really still is going to lead back to the same place. And first, before I go there, let me just take and share with you right here. This was an article here on Got Questions. What is the book of Jesha, and should it be in the Bible? All right, now I would have probably argued with this guy uh, only a year ago that yes, the book of Jesha should be there. And I would say that, okay, I don't necessarily agree with everything there, but I would argue that it should be there. But then we are the New Institute of Biblical Research, and what we do is we research ancient documents, whether it be the Dead Sea Scrolls, whether it be this type of material, the Book of Jeshur, etc. We research to try to find out, you know, what can we glean from these works? Uh, or is there something about it that's questionable? What well, this article here brought up one issue here that I thought was interesting. It said there are other Hebrew works that are mentioned in the Bible that God directed the authors to use. Some of these include the book of the wars of the Lord in Numbers chapter 21 verse 14, the book of Samuel the seer, the book of Nathan the prophet, and the book of Gad the seer uh, mentioned in 1 Chronicles 29, 29. But have you ever taken and even read some of the works, or at least what we have today that we say are those works. In the case of Gad the Seer, for example, you ever read Gad the Seer, it will totally unravel anything you would ever think about the Bible. So can I hold the book of Gad the Seer, at least the version we have today, to be authentic? I highly doubt that. Gad the Seer and the version that we have today paints David as a homosexual maniac murderer. Now, how could I actually then hold the, the, the work of Gad the seer to be authentic when we see our Lord is a type as the son of David? And he's typed in a good way, not in an evil way. So then how could I hold this work of Gad the seer as an authentic work when I know it contradicts the very canon of Scripture that we have. All right? And I've seen things in the book of Jesha that I would say, okay, it seems to fill in the blanks, seems to correct this problem. I've actually taught on those things. But the more you begin to examine the book of Jesha and the historicity of it, how it came into being, well, it might be a little bit more surprising than what you think. Again, on gutquestions.org, and I'd don't say that this is the foundation of what I'm going to share with you, so please be patient. I'm going to take you to the actual Jewish virtual library to share with you exactly their beliefs on the book of Jeshur as well. It says here, another book by this same name called by many, uh, by many pseudo Jeshur, while written in Hebrew, is also not the book of Jeshur mentioned in Scripture. It is a book of Jewish legends from the creation to the conquest of Canaan under Joshua, but scholars hold that it did not exist before A.D. 1625. In addition, there are several other theological works by Jewish rabbis and scholars called Sefer Hayashar, but none of these claim to be an original book of Jeshur. And the problem is not even close. That's where the issue really comes in. In the end, we must conclude that the book of Jeshur mentioned the Bible was lost and has not survived the modern times. All we really know about it, it was found in two scriptural quotations mentioned earlier. The, uh, the other books by that, by that title are mere fiction or Jewish more moral treaties. Well, does questions, uh, gotquestions.org, uh, do they have a valid statement And when they say this? Well, I'm here now on the jewishvirtuallibrary.org. Midrashim, is, it's called here. And they're speaking about many different books and writings that are actually out there. This is what they wrote about the book of Jeshur. Sefer HaYashar, in fact. A Lake Agadak, uh, Agadik work corresponding to the narratives part of the Pentateuch, you know, being Genesis and Exodus, right? Comprising more than three quarters of the work, 
Joshua and Judges. Okay, the style is fluent and the language a pure but artificial pseudo biblical Hebrew. The author used Genesis Rabbah, the Babylonian Talmud. Wow, that's interesting. Now, granted, if Mark is using the book of Jasher as his plumb line for being able to say that Melchizedek is actually Shem, all right, maybe I wouldn't throw him under the bus quite so quick, but you got to think about it though, Mark. This is why we are called to study the Word of God, because we know that it doesn't line up with Scripture in the first place. That's where the big issue comes in. And of course, as you're going to see later in this video, the Qumranite community clearly did not agree uh, with what we would be saying today that, well, Sham was actually Melchizedek. Okay, for all arguments, though, let's look and see what the book of Jasher actually says. It's in chapter 16, right? This is where they have it at. And Adonai Tzadik, right, the Lord righteous, king of Jerusalem, the same was Sham, went out with his men to meet Abram and his people with bread and wine, and they remained together in the valley of Melech, and Adonai Tzadik blessed Abram, and Abram gave him a tenth from all that he had brought from the spoil of his enemies, for Adonai Tzadik was a priest before God. Hmm. It sounds good. It sounds plausible until we begin to examine the Word of God. Now, the biggest problem, though, that I have, not, not just the fact, all right, now we can see from the Scripture we have in Genesis chapter 14, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was a priest of God the Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed is he, Abram of God Most High, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God the Most High, who hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him a tenth of all. <clears throat> so we could kind of settle that case there. But the problem is the book of Jasher makes it look like that Seth is living excuse me, not Seth, but uh, Shem is actually living in Jerusalem as the king, and that from there, well, they even go so far as to say that, uh, in the book of Jasher, actually, that Abraham went and spent time with Noah and with Shem and learned from them. That could be very well true, because Shem did outlive Abraham, according to uh, our own canon, if we look at the timeline, right? But we really run into some other problems, though, because according to Genesis chapter 12, let's notice what the scripture says. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and to the land that I will show you. I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless you, and make thy name great, and be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you, and him that curseth you will I curse. I kind of threw that one in there because I always thought it was interesting. So many times everybody says, whoever blesses Israel will be blessed, and whoever curses Israel will be cursed. No, God actually says to Abraham, he's going to bless him, and whoever curses him will be cursed, and whoever blesses him will be blessed. It isn't a singular blessing. So when God made the promise to Abraham, that did not extend out to his children other than we do have scriptures where God actually gives the same blessing over the next son, Isaac, and then even into Jacob. But we never have it collectively to the nation of Israel. But I do want to point out the fact that when the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, he was kindred to Shem. So if he was a kindred to Shem, why is Shem down in Jerusalem? You see, that doesn't seem to line up with the Scripture. Because anybody that knows anything about the Scripture, we know that that area there was Canaan. Right? Verse 5, And Abram took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance, and they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. Into the land of Canaan they came. In fact, if you look in the Dead Sea Scrolls, when he gets to the Jordan River and he's about to cross, he says to his wife, Sarah, we are entering into Egypt. 
the territory of Ham. Well, that's also written in Genesis as well, that, uh, that it was uh, that when, when Jacob comes up, remember the story of Jacob, he comes up, his, uh, his mother was afraid for his life after Esau had threatened to kill him, so he says to him that he needs to go back to their homeland up in Syria, northern Syria there, and to take a wife from their own kindred. Right, And on his way, he stops in the very place that is called Jerusalem, and he takes and he puts a stone out for a pillow for his head. Okay, and when he puts the stone out, they let we know the scripture out, speaks about, you know, there was angels that came down, there was a ladder from heaven down to this place, and they were ascending and descending. And, and Jacob said, this must, be the, this must be the dwelling place of God. Wow, Beit El, he actually calls it. And of course, if Shem, Noah's youngest son, was living there in Jerusalem as the king of Jerusalem, then you tell me why was Jacob then sleeping out underneath the stars with a stone pillow when he could have went to Shem's house? So in this case, I have to agree with even what is stated by the Jewish Virtual Library that it was also they used the Babylonian Talmud to write it. In fact, there is also the argument, and I don't know if you're aware of this, I think two of the translators are, are, are those that actually brought this book into modern uh, times, I want to say back in the modern times, in 1700s, etc., were Jewish writers. And it was, they said that there was, the, the, the story behind this was there was so much excitement because the scripture quoted the book of Jeshur, and they said it has to be a missing book, how much the people would love to know what was written in it. And quite frankly, you can't help but wonder if it wasn't a way to be able to keep the people from knowing that Yeshua was really going to be the Messiah, that he was the Melchizedek priesthood. So, when we look at this, it totally doesn't agree with Scripture. No matter which way you look at it, it doesn't agree with the Word of Almighty God. And that's where really the big problem comes in, right? So, so when I say that Mark takes it from the Talmud, you know, I have to argue that, that, that there's a lot of truth to this. I would imagine Mark, like myself, has a chamash. All right, and no, yeah, maybe he does take it from the book of Jeshur as well. But when he starts talking about that, there was a, that it was that it was believed that there was a school in Jerusalem. That's completely Talmudic. You can't even take that with the book of Jeshur. Then I mean, all we have in the book of Jeshur is that Abraham goes and he studies underneath there, uh, underneath uh, Noah and Shem for thirty nine years. I think it's in chapter nine of the book of Jeshur, right? But there again, if we're already finding out from the historicity of how the book came about that it was built with part Talmudic ideology, then you have to ask the question, all right, what kind of Talmudic ideology do we have there then? Well, let's take a look. Inside, because those of you that have a chumash, which is the, uh, the, it contains the Torah, the five books of Moses, it's not just the Torah, it also carries in all of the nice, wonderful uh, thoughts of Talmudic rabbis, right? All right, so here's, here's mine right here, and it says here about Melchizedek, whom the sages identify as Shem, son of Noah. He was called Melchizedek because he was the king of the future site of the temple, the home of the righteousness, the home uh, of righteousness. As the most honored of Noah's children, Shem was made the priest of God in Jerusalem. That was according to Rambam. That was, that was about a thousand years ago that this was stated. So no wonder why they say that the Talmud was used to be able to write the book of Jeshur, and no doubt, as Rambam states in here, that Shem was Melchizedek, where, and, and yet there's no basis biblically for Shem living in Jerusalem. Why would Shem be living in the land of Ham? When clearly God says that Abram was to leave his father's house and his kindred, his family, his heirs, and go down to this place here. Also says here, the sages derived that Melchizedek did not pass on the priesthood to his heirs. It was stripped from him and given to Abraham. So that's what you get when you get into Talmudic uh, theology. You start, 
if you start digging into it from a Talmudic perspective, and again, if Mark took it from the book of Jeshur, at least part of what he's teaching is coming from the book of Jeshur, all right, then, all right, maybe he just honestly doesn't know. But the problem is, is that we know that in the Talmud, here it is right here, because they actually, in the, in the, they're quoting from the Talmud, and this is from the Sonsino Talmud, what I have here on the shelf, actually, uh, this volume right here is one of the ones where it's quoting from. This is the uh, Nidarim uh, in volume 3, and it states here, our Zechariah, which stands for Rabbi, uh, Zechariah said unto Rabbi Ishmael of authority, the Holy One, blessed be he, intended to bring forth the priesthood from Sham. In other words, I, the book of Jeshur, we find out, is built also off of Talmudic uh, legends. And so therefore, here just to give you an idea of what more Talmudic legends we could run into. This is why I say, you know, I mean, Mark, he did this big, big to do about because we're laying flat these seven Noahide laws. And so he says, oh, it's such a wicked thing because they came from the Talmud. Well, Mark, you don't tell your people that those seven Noahide laws have hundreds of sub-laws coming from the same source from Rambam. And of course, rabbis continue to add sub-laws to that. And they do call for the beheading of those that believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Yes, that's why it's a big issue. And just like it is here in the Nadarim, right? But because he gave precedence in his blessing to Abram of, over God, he brought it forth from Abram as it is written, and the bless and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, said Abraham to him. Is the blessing of a servant to be given precedence over that of his master? Straightway, straightway it, the priesthood, was given to Abraham. That's definitely not biblical. Now, I'm not saying Mark said this. Mark doesn't say this part here. But the issue, the point I'm trying to get you to understand, this is how serious it gets when you begin to use Talmudic, as, uh, as Yitzhak Shapira says, the Talmud is our treasure. And it goes against everything that's in the Word of God. Nowhere does God ever say that he ripped it from uh, Melchizedek and give it to Abraham. I mean, that totally goes against logic. It goes against all the scriptures, both Old and New Testament alike. Right? Well, mm. I, 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 I'm, I'm blown away. All right, so where do we go to next here? Now, we're going to be going here in just a moment. Wrong way. Going here in just a moment here to... Um, over to share with you those things that are found in the Qumran scrolls. And of course, that is what we actually recorded last night, so I'm sure it'll be a blessing to you. But before I do, let's take a look at some more scriptural evidence of what we're talking about here. All right. If you go to, um, let's see, do I want to go there? Okay. Um, let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. All right. By faith, Abraham, he, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise. Now, that's important as well. There's an, that's another scripture that tells you that Shem didn't live in Jerusalem at that time. Because it says here in the book of Hebrews... He was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obey, and he went out not knowing whether he went. Do you, do you know that's in Genesis as well? Let's see. Is it Genesis 12? Uh, they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and to the land of Canaan they came, and Abram passed through the land into the place of Shechem, and to the Terebinth, the Mora, and the Canaanite was... Uh, then in the land, and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed, I will give this land. And he, okay, no, it's not there. There was another place that was from last night. I forget exactly now where it's at. But anyway, according to the book of Hebrews, he went to a place and he didn't know where he went. Well, if in that case there, if the book of Jasher was accurate, and Abraham went and studied under Noah and Shem, not saying that he didn't possibly do that, but it's not accurate to say it was in Jerusalem because he went to a land that he didn't know where he was going. If Abraham 
then studied underneath Ham and, and uh, excuse me, uh, underneath Noah and Shem, and he was living in Jerusalem, and he knew full well where he was going, wouldn't he? But he doesn't. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him the same of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That is provocative in itself. If he's looking for a land whose builder and maker is God, he must have met God somewhere along the way. And there's, you know, we could argue this from the book of John. Uh, if you go to the Gospel of John right here, it's amazing here where Jesus speaking to, to uh, the Pharisees. Uh, now, I always like to bring out verse 37 because... He says, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. But he also says they're seed of the vipers, serpents, right? And he says they're children of the devil. How could they be Abraham's seed and be children of the devil? Because of their mothers. This is why, and it's just a conjecture, I think this is the reason why the Jews of today try to say that you're Jewish by your mother, not your father. Because those Pharisees know their fathers don't trace back through Abraham. That's right. They know they're Edomites, and they know that they have mingled the seed, that when they did have fathers that were probably back true, they'd mingled that seed right there during the times, well, we could go back many times. It happened uh, back when they were in the wilderness journey. We could take it back to when they went, uh, according to the book of Ezra, they go up there and they mingle the seed there, the Levites, the chief of the priests and everything, they mingle the seed brought forth these Nephilim bloodline, according to Numbers 13, verse 33, right? We, we see that too, right? So, it's just a mess. But anyway, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. Now, unfortunately, you can't see it in red, because when you highlight it, it turns the letters to black, but it's still Jesus speaking, says they, or not, no, it's not him, but he'll speak in a moment, it'll still be black. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. That's how you know that they're seed of Abraham because of their mothers and not because of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Whoa. You seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Now the question has to be, is whether or not Jesus, he's claiming that he was there with Abraham. Is he speaking about the time when he was with Abraham and he's talking about the destruction of Sodom? Or is he speaking of the time when he meets Abraham after, uh, the, uh, in the form of Melchizedek? And Abraham gives him a tithe. Because Christ comes after the order of Melchizedek, not after according to the Levitical law, but after the order of the priest of, of Melchizedek. Watch what he says. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to, to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. You, you notice that we be not born of fornication. He knows that when they said that their father is a devil, they know good and well that he was able to identify that their seed had been mingled up in Babylon. So that why, that's why they're trying to defend themselves. We'd be not born of fornication. I wasn't, we weren't the ones that were born through this. Well, yes, they were. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's word. You therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Then answered the Jews, watch this, and said unto him, Say we not that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil. Now they're trying to say that Jesus was a hybrid child. Right? 
Samaritan being half Jew, half Gentile, right? And it is in their own line customs that the Talmudic beliefs, they believe that uh, Mary was impregnated by a Roman soldier. That's why they make that claim there. Jesus answered and said, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Now watch what they say here. This is why I say, and it could be that Yeshua was in both places. He was Melchizedek, and he was uh, there as the God that spoke to Abraham when he asked Abraham, if there be ten righteous in the city, will you spare it for the sake of ten? And he said, if there be ten, I will spare it for the sake of the ten. Watch what he says. Then said the Jews unto him, now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead. And the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou, thou thyself? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, and whom you say that, that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I have known him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar likened unto you. But I know him and keep his sayings. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Whoa! He not only claimed to see Abraham and talk to him, but he also said of, that he was when he says, before Abraham was, I am. Now he's claiming to be the very one, the Ihaye, that spoke to Moses at the burning bush. Right? You want it? Let's just look at it. Exodus chapter 3, right? I believe that's where we're going. Right? That's, that's, that's exactly the way. Right? Let's see. We'll find it here. Yeah, here we go. And highlight it up for you real good here so you can see it better, right? I am is the one that Moses met at the burning bush. And Jesus just got through saying, before Abraham was, I am. And some like to say it means, well, he just meant he existed. Okay. Yeah, I don't care how you want to look at it. And the thing is, is Abraham, according to the book of Hebrews, he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Why was he looking for a city like this? Why was he even looking on earth? Because he met the king. Malchi Tzadik, the righteous king. He had no father, no mother, no beginning of days, no ending of life. How could he be Sham? Sham has a father. Sham has a mother. That's how we know then that the, when, when even the Jewish virtual library tells you that the book of Jasher is written of a collection of works including the Babylonian Talmud. They admit it. <laughs> oh my goodness. They admit it themselves. They even say the first published in Venice in 1625. It has since been republished many times. So, I'm not saying, if you don't want to read, I mean, if you want to read it, read, read Jason, that's up to you. But now that I have a better understanding of what the historicity is of it, I know that there is a real book of Jason. There has to be one somewhere, because there was. And I believe that there's a real book of the Gad the Seer. But whether or not I can accept the one that they have today, I, I just can't. This is why I really appreciate the Dead Sea Scrolls, because in the Dead Sea Scrolls here, 
You know, I, and I can't say that they're all perfect 100%. No, I don't say that. You know, but even in the Dead Sea Scrolls, once we get into this here, and we're going to go to this, you're going to be blown away by what the Qumranite community believed about Melchizedek. They, the, no wonder why the, the Paul, when he writes in Hebrews that, that Melchizedek had neither father nor mother in the ending of days or ending of life. He, oh my goodness, they got it as well. Melchizedek, who will free them from the hand of Belial? Satan, who's going to free them from Satan is for what he said. In Leviticus 25, 9, you shall blow the horn and oh, oh, just listen, let's listen. Look, I love you guys. I really do. And Mark, I love you, my brother. I, I just pray that you get away from this Talmudic idea. I, I, I understand. I, 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 can, I can have a heart and compassion and feel for you, my brother. I was just as blind into these things as what you are, my brother. All right. So with this in mind, continue. Listen to the rest of this video here. I'll go into the to the parts here. If you listen to some part there and I'm hitting more on the Talmudic side, just keep in mind, I had to edit in this part about the book of Jasher, because in all fairness to Mark, I realize as the person commented, he may be taking it from the book of Jasher. All right. But I needed to clarify for you guys how the book of Jasher came to be, at least the one we have today. For example, all right, and we read right here in Genesis 28, because first I need to, I want to deal with this issue about um, was Shem actually a teacher, or excuse me, was Shem or Melchizedek, did he have a school there in Jerusalem? That's one issue we need to address. So we look at here at Genesis 28, and I think that Genesis 28 kind of settles that question for us, because it says here, and this is, you got to remember, this is when Esau and Jacob they're, 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 they're going through this, uh, you know, Esau's wanting to kill his brother, so Jacob is getting ready to flee and get away because his mother has already told him to go to Haran where my brother is, Laban, and you're to take a wife from my brother in order to protect your son, right? Well, if Shem was in Jerusalem, why didn't he just go to Jerusalem and stay with Shem? Ah, couldn't be, right? And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran, and he lighted upon the place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set, and he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. Again, like I said, if Shem was living there, why not go live with Grandpa? Now, why not, or at least go stay the night with him, even though you're going to Haran. But no, he's staying out in the middle of a field. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up, set up, up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to thee, will I give it unto thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Doesn't mention anything about Shem or Melchizedek living in this area. Right? And behold, I am with thee and will help thee. And whithersoever thou goest, I will bring thee back into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done uh, that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. What? Achin yesh Yehovah bemekum hazeh ve'anoch elo yadati? Jacob doesn't know that God is here, and yet the sages are trying to teach us and tell us that by the way, Melchizedek, who was the righteous teacher, and they're claiming that Shem, Noah's youngest son, was Melchizedek, has a school in Jerusalem, and he's a righteous teacher, and Jacob is there in Jerusalem, right where the temple is going to be built later, many years later, and that, oh, wow, by the way, I had no idea God was living here. <laughs> I'm blown away by this. And Mark will teach his people that not only did Jacob come, but Isaac also, they would come to Jerusalem and study under Melchizedek, or Sham, as he put it. Well, it goes on to say in verse 17, the Yara, the Yomer, Manora, Hamakum Hazeh, Enze, Ki im Bayat Elohim, Veze Sha'a Hashemaim. This must be the gate of where God is. 
wow, if he was going there for Bible studies there with Shem because he was Melchizedek, or Melchizedek, the righteous king of Salem there, which they claim to be, okay, you get the point. It just doesn't make sense, does it? It seems pretty, pretty crazy. But again, so does the idea that Melchizedek could be Shem. Why would I even say that? Well, let's take, for example, just from the book of Hebrews, right? Chapter 7, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, whom met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, after that also king of Salem, which is what? King of peace. If I remember right, Isaiah spoke about the birth of Christ, that he would be called what? The Prince of Peace, which would make him the son of Melchizedek. Now, the obvious thing to a Christian believer would be that if Yeshua is called the Prince of Peace, according to Isaiah's prophecy, a child is born, his name should be called Counselor, Wonderful, Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, right? Hmm, wouldn't then his father be the king of peace? So Melchizedek, according to that prophecy of Isaiah, would have to be God himself. Well, maybe Hebrews kind of clears this up for us. It does, without father. Who is Melchizedek? He has no father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor ending of end of life. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Mark, if Sham, and, and I grant it, Mark, I know that's not you. This was the Talmud rabbis that said this. Rambam right, wrote it, right? Or whichever one wrote it. Anyway, I think Rambam, right? Okay. So anyway, he writes that Sham is Melchizedek. But yet, as a believer in Jesus, or Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, as a believer in Yeshua, we would have to say then, that we know who the father and mother of Shem is, Noah. And I would think that if Paul was the writer of the book of Hebrews, and I know there's some debate among scholars, some believe that it was uh, Priscilla, uh, some, uh, there, there could be other conjectures. I'm not, in, I'm not here to debate any of that. It doesn't matter to me. I, I'll just hold it to Paul, attribute it to Paul, which I know that there's a major attack against Paul, and I'll tell you why. If you can destroy and discredit Paul as being a true apostle, then you can fundamentally destroy Christianity, uh, and you can get Jesus down to just nobody. That's what they really would like to do. But anyway, and I don't think that uh, Mark is in that category. So Mark, if the writer of Hebrews, if Paul says here that Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Whoa! Now that just blasted the Talmud right into the toilet. Why do I say that? Well, let's just look at what the Talmud says again. Uh, come on, let's face the facts and let's look at what the Talmud says. All right, the Talmud says right here, it is the blessing of the servant to be given precedence over that of his master straightway. Yet the priesthood was given to Abraham. So, according to the Talmud, the priesthood was ripped from Sham and given to Abraham, or ripped, in this case, from Melchizedek and given to Abraham. So, therefore, the Talmud is in direct contradiction to what the writer of Hebrews actually says here, that he abideth a priest continually. <clears throat> that means there's not an end of his priesthood. Now consider how great this man was, and to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Oh, I'm sorry, but the Talmud doesn't say that either. Hmm. Priest most of implying that, okay, he was a priest, but not his seed. Uh, I don't have that part in front of me. Oh, I get it. I think it was actually in the, over here. Yes, strip him and give. Yeah, oh, well, this is a different one altogether, but I'll, I'll bring this back up as well. The sages derived that Melchizedek did not pass on the priesthood to his heir. It was stripped from him and given to Abraham, according to, to Nidraim 
And uh, But if we go down where it talks about verse 15, I think this is the one... Uh, well, this is just where he says Shem was the priest of God in Jerusalem. That's just where Rambam says that there. I, I was looking because there's, by the way, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, and I don't have this up. I had it actually a little earlier, but I think I removed it uh, where the where the different sages and rabbis actually disagree with each other. That, that's even funnier if you get into that. So the point being, though, according to the book of Hebrews, it sounds like that Melchizedek is a supernatural priest, not just an earthly priest, right? And verily they that are the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people. So there's a similitude. I'll agree with Mark on that. The Levitical priesthood was a similitude, but they're not after the order of Melchizedek other than taking other tithes. That is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descendant is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. So Melchizedek is of no descent. There's no, see, but he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham. So there again, how can we say that he's Shem? There's no connection to Shem. Anyway, so that's kind of just to set that little base foundation for you right there. Uh, I'm just trying to see for he, for let's go down to verse 10. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Elchizedek met him. Uh, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Now that's powerful in itself. Now this is kind of, we're going, we're kind of going more into the look teaching of Melchizedek now. Uh, you know, maybe we'll come back to some of the things that Mark has taught on this, but it says there is, if therefore perfection were by Levitical priesthood, all right? For under it, the people received the law, Levitical law, right? If perfection were by Levitical law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Now, that's powerful. And you have to ask yourself the question, where did Paul get this from? It goes on, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of a necessity of change also of the law. Now, this is why they don't like the writer of Hebrews, or Paul in this case, because there is a necessity of a change of law because Melchizedek is not after the order of the Levitical law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord, speaking of Jesus Christ, sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of carnal commandment but after the power of endless life. All right, so we cannot say that Levitical law is a well of water, especially when Christ says to the woman at the well, if you knew it was, it was speaking to you, you would ask me for a drink and I would give you water that you don't have to come from this well to draw anymore. So if you want to take the type that Mark was using for anti-Semitism, where they go back and they redig up the wells and they're saying that the Christian anti-Semitism is plugging up the wells, well, hello, Jesus said to the woman at the well of Samaria, I'll give you water that you don't got to go back to that well no more. Whoa, praise be to God. You want to talk about the types and shadows there, glory to God. You don't even have to go back to your Talmudic wells no more. You don't have to go back even to the Levitical well no more, Mark. Because Jesus Christ is that living water. He is the continuation of the Melchizedek priesthood. He is that new law that is a law of life, a spring of living water that does not require for you to drink out of the well of Levitical law. Think about that. For he testified, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Wow! Praise be to God. Let's look at some of these scriptures here. Now, therefore, my people shall know my name. 
Therefore they shall know that in that day I even that he that spoke, behold, here I am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger of good tidings. I love it. Right? The messenger of good tidings. All right? That announceth peace, peace, the harbinger of good tidings that announces salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Hark, thy watchmen, they lift up the voice together, they sing, for they shall see eye to eye the Lord returning to Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. That was when Jesus Christ came on the scene, right? Now, let's just take a look here. Romans uh, chapter 10. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom in him believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of him that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said to the Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. But I did, but I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy to them that are no people, and I will, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. Now we're getting into the issue about the Gentiles coming in. I'll skip over that for this for, for the sake of time here. But the point I wanted to show you here though is it again even in Romans, he talks about that messenger coming, right? Now, before I go into Psalms and Isaiah, I want to share with you uh, another amazing work here. And this is from, uh, uh, let's see here. This is from the Qumran Scrolls. Now, recently someone had sent me a, a, a message with a video from Nehemia Gordon uh, and I think they were a little bit afraid, thinking that the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, are fake. Well, no, they're not. They're not fake, not in the slightest bit are they fake. But if you go and you look up, Nehemiah Gordon, he, he titled a video something about, uh, something about dealing with the uh, fake Dead Sea Scrolls. But Nehemiah is not saying the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were fake. He's actually talking about a small number of fragments that have appeared in more modern times. I think after the year 2003, there were a small set of fragments that came on the market that scholars were believing they were forgeries. Uh, but if you listen to the video that Nehemiah does with his guests there, they, go, they clearly state that the fragments that were originally found back in the late 40s, early 50s, all the way up to the year 2000 and plus, where they're still searching in Cave 12 right now, these fragments are all bona fide, 100% accurate, and it's one of the best finds that's ever, been, that's ever been discovered. In fact, they go into some great things in this video, so I do encourage you to find that video with Nehemia Gordon and his guest. Uh, because in that particular video, he also talks about a Genesis scroll, a, a, a large Genesis scroll that was found in one of the caves that they've never allowed to make public before. They also talk about a Leviticus uh, scroll, a fragment that is owned by uh, a, 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 the Baptist Seminary College in Fort Worth, Texas, and I'm trying to get in touch with them. I want to see it. They have Leviticus 18, which talks about the sexual sins of Israel, and it has things written there that has never been before seen. Oh, this is why I wished all these scrolls were made public. But you know why Israel won't make it public? Because it reveals the sins of the Nephilim. It shows you who the true Levitical uh, priest is and who the false Hasmonean dynasty is and that's why they won't bring it out so let's take a look though and this is not a fake Dead Sea Scroll this is from Cave 11 in Qumran the Melchizedek Scroll as it's known uh, number 13 and number 14 and I'm going to blow this up so you can see this a little bit better on your screen I have it both in the Hebrew and in the English now of course this is transliterated uh, so you 
don't actually get the uh, the actual fragment. I do have access to these fragments uh, as Danun Institute, but uh, in this case here, we used uh, uh, this this book here just so you can see it. I, this is one of my own collections here. I can share that with you. Now they're writing about Melchizedek here, and this is what they say here. And and I'm I, some what I have highlighted in yellow is just things that I highlight, but there's more that I'm going to read for you. And as for what he said, and he quotes from Leviticus 25.13. Now, when he quotes from Leviticus 25.13, the writer that's writing this is not writing over here Leviticus 25.13. Uh, it's only what you see in English is written over here. Sometimes I disagree with the way they translate it, but in this particular fragment here, uh, it's nothing, or, or this is more than just a fragment, but it's nothing important. And no major differences, in my opinion. In this year of Jubilee, you shall return each one to his respective property. Uh, and I think it's interesting when he gets into the Jubilee, because if you look at the Jubilee that he's talking about here, it actually, if you count the Jubilees, the nine Jubilees here, and he's going to take you right up to the Day of Atonement in this fragment, but it's also the exact same time that Yeshua came on the scene. Uh, 80, or he started his ministry, I think it is, in eighty thirty two or something like that. So it's really amazing when I read this fragment. I just love this fragment. Anyway, he says, You shall return each one to his respective property. Concerning it, he said, and he quotes from Deuteronomy 15, 2, This is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he lent to his neighbor. He shall not coerce his neighbor or his brother, which, by the way, they're able to put more of that in there because that part's not in the fragment. It was kind of missing, but we already know what Deuteronomy 15.2 says in the Masoretic text. So they're just including in the brackets that part there for you. All right. He shall not coerce his neighbor or his brother, for it, is, it, has been, it, it has been proclaimed a release for God, its interpretation. Now, this is, this is the Qumranite community, community giving their interpretation for the year of Jubilee. All right. And they really... I don't agree with all the doctrines of the Qumranite community, but I have to tell you something. Their, their insights on Melchizedek are mind-blowing. And it, you can tell the Pharisees, they believe the Pharisees were the sons of darkness. Well, I think this scroll here is light, and I do agree that the Pharisaic Talmud is from the sons of darkness. I agree with them. So anyway, he goes on, he says here, it's the release for God. For the last days refers to the captives who, there's a blank spot, and whose teacher, teachers have been hidden and kept secret and from the inheritance of Melchizedek. For, there's a blank spot, and they are the inheritance of Melchizedek who will make them return. Now, you have to understand what he's saying here when they say they're in the inheritance of Melchizedek. I mean, we're talking about Jesus Christ. Right? I mean... They don't even know Jesus has come yet. But Christ inherits. His inheritance are the children. And it's not just Israel. It's the Gentiles as well. Right? The Gentiles and the, and the Jewish people of that day, the Israelites, the 12 tribes of Israel, you know, those that is his inheritance. He came to buy them back. He came to pay the price for the iniquity. The sins of Adam and Eve. He came to pay that price. Right? So he says, they are, they are the inheritance of Melchizedek who will make them return and liberty will be proclaimed for them to free from the debt of all their iniquities. So the whole law of Jubilee, like any Christian would know, is that Christ liberated us. And everybody knows that, you know, that he, you know, he died on a Jubilee year. Right? Okay, listen. Oh, wow, I love this. And liberty will be proclaimed for them to free them from the debt of all their iniquities. And this will happen in the first week of the Jubilee, which follows the nine Jubilees. Now watch this. And, and, and this is right here in the middle here. And this will happen in the first week of the Jubilees, which follows the nine Jubilees. And the day of atonement is ended of the tenth jubilee, in which atonement shall be made for all the sons of light and for the men of the lot of Melchizedek. 
Remember I told you I'm, I'm working on this message about the feast being fulfilled? They even knew that when Christ came, that which they call it Melchizedek, they call, they're calling our Savior, Jesus Christ, Melchizedek. He hasn't come yet, but they're saying that he's the one that's coming. And that when he comes, the, the Feast of Atonement is going to be fulfilled. And we know this is true because in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, John declares to us that when they were mourning over Christ, that that was the Feast of Atonement. I, I, listen, I used to have it the other way around, friends. I agree. God forgive me. I didn't know. I was like many other Zionists. I was putting these things off in the future. That's why Mark, listen, brother. That's why I, 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 I kind of feel for you too, brother, because I was where you were, putting people, everything in the future, in the future, in the future. And not to say there are things still coming. I agree with that. But most of the things that we put in the future has already happened. And the thing is, is the next thing to come is when Christ comes, this next time it's judgment. Watch what they say here. According to all their works, for it is the time for the year of grace of Melchizedek. What? The year of grace? Are you serious? This is what Christians teach. And of his armies, the nations of all the holy ones of God and the rule of judgment has written about him in the songs of David who said, and he quotes Psalm 82.1, Elohim will stand in the assembly of God in the midst of God's he judges. And upon him he said, and so he quotes Psalm 7, verses 8 and 9, and above it, to the heights return, God will judge the peoples. And as for what he said in Psalm 82, verse 2, goes to the second verse, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Whoa. <laughs> Let's take a look at 82. Let's take a look at Psalm 82. Maybe that's what we need to do is go take a look at some of these. Right? So let's jump over to Psalm 82. God standeth in the congregation. Right? In the midst of the judges, he judgeth. How long will you judge unjustly and respect the persons of the wicked? Oh, wow. Judge the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the destitute. I mean, is that not the words of Jesus Christ? When he was here? Do you not see this? Jesus said, you, 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 you totally neglect the weightier, the weighter matters of the law. You don't think about the widow, or the poor, or the oppressed. He said, those you should have done and not left the other undone. But he said, you strain, you said, you, you care more about the washing of pots and pans. Why? Because it's Talmud. He said, those are doctrines of the commandments of men. So what does he say? God standeth in the congregation of God. In the midst of the judges, he judgeth. That's Jesus Christ. And the Qumranite community recognize that it would be the priesthood of Melchizedek. Then you go, they go on to say, but Melchizedek will carry out vengeance of God's judgments. On that day he will, all right, let's go to the next part of it. Let me shrink it back down here. He will free them from the hand of Belial and from the hand of all the spirits of his lot. Didn't Christ come and do that? He set us free. When he gave his life, he gave his life so his life could come back upon us. That was the well of living water. Mark, this is the well. Christ is that well. That's the well we should be drinking from. To his age shall come all the gods of justice. He is the one who, there's a blank spot, all the sons of God, all right, let me drop down a little bit. Through Isaiah the prophet who said, in Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, the messenger of good, who announces salvation, saying to Zion, your God reigns. 
They knew that the Mashiach, the Messiah, was going to come and he was going to be the one that would say, your God reigns, that he was the messenger. You want to know how we know this? Because they tell you, they show you who the Melchizedek is. All right, it's interpretations, the mountains, now they, I don't necessarily agree with this, the mountains of the prophets, blank spot, and the messenger, he goes on, is the anointed of the Spirit, as Daniel said, about him. That's Daniel chapter 9, 25, right? Let's look and see. Right? There you go. Mashiach Nagid, an anointed prince, shall be seven weeks for three score and two weeks, and it shall be built again a broad place and a moat, but in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall an anointed one be cut off. Do you know the Qumranite community knew that that priest was going to be cut off and killed? And they even knew that it would be the prince of the temple, which would be the high priest. They knew the high priest would be the one that would kill him. I'll show that to you as well. Oh, wow. All right. Let's look here. Until an anointed prince, it is seven weeks. And the messenger of good who announces salvation is one about whom it is written. <laughs> so they link Isaiah 52 with Daniel 9. To comfort the afflicted, it is interpretation. To instruct them in all the ages of the world. To do what? To comfort the afflicted? Do you realize they're quoting? Are they, the, the part of the fragment is missing. But we know where they're quoting from. Isaiah 61. Right? Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings unto the humble. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, opening the eyes of them that are bound, to proclaim what? The year of the Lord's good pleasure. And also the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them and that mourn in Zion to give unto them garland for ashes. His vengeance is coming. Just give it time. Let me, we're fixing to close here, guys. I'm sorry to keep you so long. And the judgments of God, as it is written about him in Isaiah 52, 7, saying to Zion, your God rules, the congregation of all the sons of justice, those who establish the covenant, those who avoid walking on the path of the people, and your God is, and to give a blank spot, Melchizedek, who will free them from the hand of Belial, and is for what he said in Leviticus 25, 9, you shall blow the horn in all the land. Think about all that, guys. Uh, let me see. I don't know if I have it. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll read it for you. I said I'd tell you about it. I'll show it to you and I'll read it to you. This is this one here is from Garcia Martinez. Uh, he is a professor uh, and also a scholar of, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. He's worked extensively with them uh, himself as well as uh, uh, Ebert. Uh, oh, actually, you know what? It was actually Ebert uh, Tigchilar. Uh, this man right here, he's the one that Nehemia Gordon had on that they were talking about. Uh, the, you know, since 2003, there had come on there some of the uh, fragments that were not uh, authentic. Uh, that's kind of interesting. I had no idea that Ebert's name was on here. So, yes. But anyway, in, in the scroll right here, okay, after the Melchizedek, and also in uh, 11Q14, uh, we, we have here, and that's considered part of the Melchizedek scroll here, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but he says right here, okay, and the prince of the congregation will kill him, the bud of David, because it says here in the beginning, the bud of David, as the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 10, 34, and they shall cut the most massive of the forest with an iron and Lebanon with its magnificent will fall. A shoot will emerge from the stump of Jesse. All right, but he goes on to say it. There's a blank spot, but he says, the prince of the congregation will kill him, the butt of David. And that's exactly what happened. Just so you guys can see that for yourself. There it is. I wanted you to be able to see that. Listen, those of you that, that know Mark, you know, let him know. 
listen, we love Mark. I, I'm angry with him that he continues to fall in this same trap. You know, and but Mark, quit, please let him know. Stop teaching Talmud to people. We need to get back to the true well, the well of Christ Jesus. That's, you know, take the word of God, Mark. Take the word of God and teach the word of God. Get away from Talmudic teachings. You know? Go back to the basics. I, I trust the message is a blessing to you. Uh, listen, check out Israeli News Live. Uh, there's a beautiful interview. Uh, Yana uh, spearheaded the interview there with uh, Chuck Baldwin. But amazing interview. But anyway, listen, if you want to support the broadcast, we do need your help. Uh, I know December is a month where a lot of people are busy. They have other things that they're doing during this month here. But, uh, you know, pray about it and ask God to lead you to see if he leads you to give to the ministry, do so. If he doesn't, then by all means don't. But if he does lead you to, please uh, help us out this month. And you can do so by visiting our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. And uh, that appears here on the bottom of your screen, as well as at the end of the video, just past the video, when it all fades away, you'll see our mailing address as well. And I'll try to include all that in the description below. And also join Patreon. Uh, listen, you can always give on Patreon, especially if you want to be a regular contributor. Patreon allows that. Uh, we don't post there constantly, but it gives you a way to support the ministry. Plus, you'll get little insights from time to time that we don't share here. Not that I wouldn't share good insights here, but there's some things that are very risky to share, so we put it over on Patreon instead. Uh, Yana writes over there as well, so you might want to consider that. Uh, anyway, God bless you. Thank you for, for listening tonight. And uh, listen, listen, pray for Mark. Pray for Yitzhak Shapira. Pray for all these different leaders that are out there trying to put the, the, the believers underneath Talmudic rabbis. It's totally wrong. I do thank God that I saw Yitzhak Shapir come against the seven Noahide laws, uh, you know, over in India. I don't know if that's just a, a, a game or if he was really sincere about it. But if he's sincere about it, uh, I appreciate that he's made that stance there. Of course, Mark teaching that they're perfectly okay. So, 